Hello, I'm Afro Raymond. Thanks for tuning in to this episode in which we're going to be discussing hotel facts, the background to all the existing and proposed state-owned hotels in Trinidad and Tobago. At this moment, one of the issues in the buzz in the back half of 2016 is the proposal for a massive 750 room sandals resort in Tobago. And I want to take the, the opportunity here in this episode to discuss some of the facts and the background. In other words, what we know and what we don't know, what some people call the gap analysis about the hotel facts. So we can get a proper context to understand just what is the water we're swimming in. The first thing I want to say is we have to look at the model. What is the model by which state-owned hotels have existed in this country? Large state-owned hotels. And what is the model by which large state-owned hotels exist in other parts of the Caribbean? And what can we learn? There are two dominant models, and we can move quickly to say that the first model, which I would call the Trinidad and Tobago model, is one in which our treasury has paid to design, build, fit, and furnish the hotels. That is applicable for Trinidad Hilton, which is near the Savannah. That is applicable for Tobago Hilton, now known as Magdalena Grand. And that too is applicable for the Hyatt Regency down at Rison Road in Port of Spain. In that model, once the government has paid taxpayers' dollars to design, build, fit, and furnish the new hotel, the hotel is then operated by an international group under the terms of a management agreement in which the money is shared in a particular way between the government and the international group. That is the Trinidad and Tobago model. The second model, which is applicable, generally speaking, throughout the rest of the Caribbean, is that the developer will actually construct a hotel with their own money. And in exchange for having constructed this hotel with their own money, the host government, as it's called, would offer them tax concessions. So they get duty concessions. They can bring food and drink into the country without paying customs duty. They get tax concessions on the construction materials, on profits, on the import of vehicles, and so on and so on. So basically, they get very much something for something, quid pro quo. The question has to be, what is the model going to be employed here in Trinidad and Tobago? And let's work through the questions in, in, in an orderly fashion. And it's interesting, not everything is the same, but by examining things with a little bit of care, we can see the differences. So in Trinidad, at the moment, there are four proposed hotels. The first one is the hotel at Shagaramas, the old tracking station it's called, on the 10th of June 2016, the CDA publish a request for expressions of interest to put a new hotel. Second example is the Invaders Bay. Thirdly, we have the Ministry of Agriculture site, which is at the top of what we call the Magnificent Seven by the Savannah. And that is a parcel of land that has been earmarked for a large scale development, design, finance, build. And the fourth example, which we started off with, is the Sanders example of 750 rooms in Tobago. The four hotel investments that I identified could be distinguished as follows. The first one is a relatively small proposed development at Chagaramas at the old tracking station. The second example is the Ministry of Agriculture at the top of the Magnificent Seven. And that is one type of development because in that first class, what is happening is that the the proposal is being advertised. People are being invited to, to put expressions of interest forward. And it's an, in, in that respect, it's an open process. This, the other two proposals are not open. And it's very interesting how something can be, can be an open secret or a public-private deal. You know, we talk about public-private partnership. These deals are all public-private partnerships. But let me give you another way to understand it. So we have Invaders Bay, where Minister of Finance Imbert told us on the 8th of April 2016, when he gave his mid-year budget review, he told us that there was going to be a major international financial center, a convention center, and a five-star luxury hotel built at Invaders Bay. And Imbert more or less told us that it was Chinese interests who were going to build it. I believe it's going to be a government-to-government -government arrangement. But what's interesting, and the public must note these things because those are our interests, those are our lands being invested there, our concessions. The public must note that what's interesting 
is although there has been discussion and there has been conversation, there has been no advertisement and there has been no invitation to participate. So in fact, we're looking at a soul selective situation. The second example is the one we started off with, Sandals in Tobago, 750 rooms, Butch Stewart, Dr. Keith Rowley, um, Ove London, possibly No Man's Land that was discarded. Now we're talking about the Golden Grove Estate and so on and so on. And really, no invitation, no advertisement. We don't actually have any way to weigh the options. Would the Four Seasons have been a better option than Sandals? Um, would Hilton have been a better option than Sandals? Are there other companies that could have come to Tobago? I don't know. I mean, do you? So you see, what we have is a situation, again, the, the professional word for it is soul selective, where the administration, the executive, has made a decision to enter negotiations with a particular person, both at Invaders Bay and with the Sandals proposal. And I want to say, just for those of you who might be thinking that I mean a particular thing, I want to say that at this moment in time, in terms of the law in Trinidad and Tobago, the government deciding to enter sole selective for a large scale project is not illegal. It is perfectly legal. Just so we understand each other, I'm not accusing anybody of anything illegal. It's perfectly legal. It may be inadvisable. And my opinion may be that it's improper. It may not accord with best practice, but it's perfectly legal at the moment in this country because we have not yet brought into place a new public procurement and disposal of public property law. We have to do that quickly. But at this moment in time, it's perfectly legal for them. I want to say in conclusion that the whole question of, of how our hotels operate, going to the, going to the current ones, is also invisible to us. I've seen no consistent account of how our hotels function. Does anyone know how much money Trinidad Hilton made in the last 10 years? Do you know? I don't know. Does anyone know what was the government's share of that? Do you know if it was actually paid? What are the terms of the agreement? Have those terms been honored? What about Hyatt? How much money has Hyatt made in the last, I think it's eight years since it was open? How much money has Hyatt made? Do you know? I don't know. Do you think we should know? Is this something we ought to know about? What about Tobago Hilton, now known as Magdalena Grand? We spent a huge amount of money to construct it, and almost 50% of that money again to fix it within 10 years of its construction. Do we know how much money it's making, how much money it's losing or gaining? And without that sort of background information, how can our people negotiate properly against seasoned international operators, successful operators like the Sandals Group? We have to have a good level of information, a good background of information in order to form strong negotiating positions to defend the national interest. Those are some of the hotel facts. I'll be doing some more research and I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you. I'm Afro Raymond. Thank you for tuning into that episode in which we dealt with some of the background facts about hotels. If you'd like to know more about this, you can go to my blog, afroraymond.net. Get informed, get involved. It's our country, it's our land, it's our future. Thank you.